Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. A really warm welcome to the CHA Annual Conference 2021. My name is Ralf Südhoff, I'm the director of the Center for Humanitarian Action, and I welcome you to our conference titled Five Years Grand Bargain, Time to Restart Humanitarian Reform. Um, I'm really happy to welcome you to this topic. Um, also on a personal note, um, I recall um, five years ago in my former life as a director of the UN World Food Program, um, I entered a meeting with Valerie Amos, then, as many of you will know, um, uh, director of OCHA and one of the key reform drivers in the run-up to the summit. And in this meeting, um, Valerie told us uh, in a remarkable phrase, um, well, what's up at the summit, the humanitarian system will reform or die. This sounds a bit gloomy and maybe um, is until today for some of you, but it um, tells us also a story what has been for many experts at stake five years ago and gives us a sense on the challenges discussed and maybe also to the ones we have to deal with right now. If we look at the COVID-19 pandemic and the challenges it has reinforced, um, I think uh, there are at least two, three, four points um, um, questioning if the system is fit for purpose. Three of these points um, we might quickly touch on. I mean, let's uh, take a look. Is the system fit for purpose in a world where the number of people in need is booming, while the donor funding is rather decreasing? Is the system fit for purpose in a world where at the same time humanitarian access issues, especially for international aid workers in this pandemic, are getting um, worse and worse, and it's more and more challenging. So we transfer more and more um, work, and by that risks, to local um, partners and um, try to be accountable to them. But are we really in a world where, thirdly, we live um, where the decision-making um, is still centered in the global north, where we decided most of these things for people in the global south? Um, against this backdrop in 2016, as many people say, uh, maybe the most ambitious humanitarian reform agenda ever has been agreed in the most inclusive way, as um, partners came together from governments, from the UN side, from the NGO world, and agreed on a grand bargain, a reform agenda, um, which was at the same time um, a kind of a mutual promise. In particular, a promise between donors of aid and aid providers, a promise to exchange two things. On the one side, it was striking like a deal that donors would share more trust into the aid providers and they would exchange it against more transparency of what they do. Trust of the donors was to be provided by far more flexible, reliable, multi-year funding which would be provided in a less bureaucratic, less mushrooming reporting world with templates and individual from each donor with reporting year by year with templates and project applications to be filled out year by year in a world where protected crisis lasts in many countries for now 20, 25 years. And that was to be exchanged against more transparency by the aid providers, by the aid actors providing value for money, demonstrating that what they do is value for money, demonstrating what the outcomes of their aid is, and not only the output of their aid supplies. And by ensuring that local actors are more and more on the driver's seat, and um, focusing less on the funding competition, and more on so-called collective outcomes, what is the overall objective of our joint operation in a crisis? So overall, the aim was to reform an aid system which some called broke at, some, uh, at that time, some called it broke, and some called it even broken. And today, many say, well, is it maybe broke and broken at the same time? So 2016 was agreed to tackle these challenges with a five years time frame, and it will expire in a few weeks. So it's time to uh, take a look and to take stock um, what has been achieved in the past five years. We are very excited to discuss this, and we believe um, even virtually, again, only virtually, our annual conference um, is the perfect place to discuss this um, in a light, for example, on the government side of a top donor, Germany, which has increased its um, humanitarian funding since the summit by more than 400%, which is an astonishing boom and has uh, an ambitious reform agenda and engagement in the international arena. 
And besides, um, we as CHAR only founded 2019, thanks to support by MSF, Caritas International, and Diakonie Katastrophenhilfe, um, feel a bit like this reform debate is uh, sort of the DNA also of our new think tank. So one month ahead of um, the next meeting on the grand bargain against the decision, uh, one month ahead of the decision if there should be a grand bargain 2.0 and if there will be a further step taken, we want to look for uh, more or less two days on a couple of key topics and um, hope we could arrange for you an ambitious and wonderful agenda which uh, my colleague Darina, who is the co-lead of this conference, um, is going to share with you. Hi Darina. Thank you, Ralph. Also from my side, um, thank you for joining us today and indeed there is a couple of hopefully interesting discussions coming up in the next two days. We will start this conference off um, with an opening panel and opening discussion where Ralph will discuss some of the more general insights uh, to the humanitarian reform process as such together with Smutri Patel, Klaus Sörensen and Farida Bena. After this, we will have the opportunity to dive more deeply into some of the, what we think, most important topics to the Grand Bargain. And we will start this off later today with our panel on the new roles for intermediaries, intermediaries in a localized humanitarian system. And in this panel, we will hear from a dedicated group of experts from various local organizations and how, on how they perceive their international partners' approaches to localization. Tomorrow, we will continue as we approach the issue of financing of the humanitarian reform. And in the panel, The Donor Paradox, Reform Drivers Blocking Reform, we will discuss with the donors their promises to provide a flexible and reliable funding to allow effective assistance and value for money. Thereby, we will not only talk to institutional governmental donors, but also uh, about UN agencies and INGOs and their role as a donor vis-a-vis -vis local actors. And finally, we will have three 30 minutes spotlight sections tomorrow to end our discussion. And therein, we will highlight some cross-cutting issues that we think should be incorporated and need to be re reflected upon in the upcoming Grand Bargain 2.0. And these will be gender, innovation, and the underlying assumptions and ethics of the humanitarian reform process. Before I hand over back to Ralph, let me quickly introduce some housekeeping rules. First of all, if you're joining us on Zoom today, please keep your camera and microphone switched off. Of course, all of your comments and thoughts and questions are still welcome. My colleague Andrea will monitor the chat where you can post all of your inputs if you like. She will introduce your inputs later in each of the sessions in the Q&A section. Furthermore, please tweet and post about us on social media using the hashtag cha underscore GB21. If you feel inspired to exchange a network more and you want to connect with your peers, you can do that uh, via our Slack channel. We put up a room where you can network and exchange most likely like in a in-person conference. Last but not least, to make sure that all our discussions are not lost in the wide range of um, technically recorded conference talks available online right now. We are very happy um, to are joined by a graphic designer today. Nicoline Liu will join us uh, from South Africa and she will put uh, live graphic records online um, and we will refer to them throughout the sessions. That's all from my side. With that, back over to you, Ralph. Thanks so much, Darina. Um, so let's uh, really jump into it. And I'm really honored to welcome our um, opening speaker and our keynote dialogue, Smruti Patel. Um, Smruti Patel is from India and the founder of the Global Mentoring Initiative. Um, she's been working in the, in the sector, as most of you will know, for more than 25 years. And she's been a key figure in the run-up to the World Humanitarian Summit, organizing a lot of consultations, um, uh, sharing the inputs at the summit. Uh, and she's a member of the reform group Charter for Change. And she's representing until today the Alliance for Empowering Partnership, 
in the grand bargain. So she's really, really into it. And who could be a better speaker for us to make sure we listen to the ones um, uh, who haven't been heard that much in the process to the representatives from the Global South in this um, event. And we start uh, this talk with her um, right now on a key issue and a really personal note, as I understand, Ruti, many thanks for joining us. First of all, um, good afternoon to you. Good afternoon. Smruti, when we, thanks for joining us. Smruti, when we talked last time, you um, shared with me um, that there is indeed a personal angle right now, um, given your home region, your home country, India, and the really bad news we hear from there related to the pandemic. Um, I understand um, that this is even enforcing, in a way, um, what you have been looking at in the humanitarian world and why you think change is needed, um, if that's a fair summary. Um, but please, over to you um, for your uh, initial input. Um, what is uh, has motivating you to engage um, in this whole process and what's at stake? Thank you so much. And it's a real honor to be here. And thank you for inviting me to um, exchange my perspective on this. So, yeah, what really motivates me? Um, I would say that, you know, I made a deliberate choice to join the aid sector. I used to work in the business sector for many years. So it is a real kind of uh, from the heart, wanting to, to join, to do and make a difference in the world. Um, I would say I've worked with a, a lot of INGOs, local organizations and the UN. So I know the system in, in its all different uh, layers. Um, but I think the particular thing that sticks in my mind of why this uh, path is really being involved in the tsunami evaluation in 2006. After the tsunami, uh, you know, there was a, a multi-sector evaluation. And I was involved um, in the impact of international response on local capacities. I have to say that really opened my eyes because what I was hearing before was, oh, we don't have enough money. That's why we can't respond in the right way. But what I saw was we had plenty of money during the tsunami response, and yet we still had a long way to go. I, I had thousands of conversations with uh, local people and organizations. And I think that's what really, I would say, set me on the path to looking at how can we increase accountability to affected populations and we give more resources to local and national actors to be able to act? Now, it doesn't mean that it's one thing or the other, right? Because we all need each other. And I want to give that as a clear message. But how we work together is so, so important. Um, I think uh, my work with uh, Humanitarian Accountability Partnership for six years put me in contact with many international organizations, staff at local level, right, in, in different countries. But also I saw how the local organizations and the communities were treated as well. And actually really uh, was aware, a lot more aware about the inequity in the system. Uh, and how do we, you know, how do you make sure that we really work in an accountable way? So that's in a way also what kind of set me on this path. Um, and having worked there for, for many years and uh, in 2015, I got involved in the, the kind of a, the consultation process pre WHS, right, in the different region. And um, one of my roles in starting to look at how we can create a southern network of organization, right? We've got many international uh, networks, but how do you create a southern one? I went to many countries and had consultations with local organizations, and that really gave me an insight into what are some of the challenges for local organizations and what do we need to do? Um, and that, I think that's what kind of gives me the insight into what are the things that are needed to be done. Um, I would say um, once um, the Grand Bargain, you know, being at the uh, World Humanitarian Summit and all the uh, processes, you know, uh, leading up to it is a really positive um, 
initiative. And actually local actors are very, were very excited about what was happening in terms of these commitments, because for the first time, localization is not a new commitment. It's been there since 1994, 95, right? But this time they really saw it being activated, actually being put somehow in, into commitments. Um, and that was really exciting to see that actually happening written into uh, a commitment. Um, I would say though uh, that uh, in terms of the real action and you talk about five years on, right? Um, so that was a, a great step and a great platform actually to have the donors, the INGOs um, together and the UN agencies together. Uh, but we know that there was a lack of um, real involvement of local organizations in the grand bargaining process. And I would say also, yes, you had um, Western governments involved, but actually a lot of the southern governments are not involved in that process either. So there's a, you know, there's a gap there. Uh, but I think the key thing is about how can we make, going forward, how can we make sure there's more involvement of local and national organizations in this whole process is, is absolutely key. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that um, one thing that really strikes is that, that uh, there are the commitments are very clear, but how is that information and where is the awareness at country level of those commitments? So in a way, there's this global uh, awareness, but it's not awareness at country level. All the institutions who are signed up to the grand bargain, how are they implementing in their organization? Is it institutionalized? Mm -hmm. um, I know that this is a question for uh, the German uh, government, you know, having committed to that, their own uh, administration, how is it doing? And German NGOs, we have been working as a global mentoring initiative. We've done a lot of work with German NGOs uh, on this issue as well. And they're now reflecting on how can they institutionalize that commitment, which is really, really important. Mm -hmm. um, I would say the, the lack of uh, understanding about what localization is also concretely, not this blah, blah, but real concretely is, is really, really important. Mm -hmm. um, and having done the research for the START network, because uh, really looking at concretely, what does that mean in action? We started uh, looking at, uh, through the consultation process, we started saying, okay, what does it really mean? And through the consultation process, we developed this seven dimensions framework. And most people know localization commitment is 25%, right? but actually there's a lot more than that. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a whole issue of quality of relationship. Um, mm -hmm. And how do you make sure that it's not just about quantity of funding, but quality of funding. Um, how do we make sure that participation is there? And they're really part of the key decision-making processes mm -hmm. that they're also involved in the mm -hmm. coordination mechanism and making decisions. Mm -hmm. At the moment, the coordination is very top down we are, mm. co you know, when there's a big um, humanitarian response, and I've been involved in some in Chechnya, in Afghanistan, also in the Indian earthquake, mm -hmm. the big machinery, the, the surge capacity, international surge capacity arrives. And I know in the tsunami evaluation, uh, they said, actually, we had a second tsunami when the international system arrived. Right. It really overwhelmed us, mm -hmm. right? So how we behave in the way we, we deploy is, mm -hmm. is also very key. Are we coordinating ourselves? Or are we, you know, helping? The whole point is that you show solidarity with the affected population in the country. Mm -hmm. So uh, should we not be coordinating with them rather than they take part in our coordination mm -hmm. mechanism? So I think these are some of the issues that we really need to think about. Of course, there's a whole issue of standards and um, and policies and how are these policies developed with information from the ground, right? Mm -hmm. From the local organizations and others who, who, let's face it, they're there before disasters, they're during disasters, they're after disasters, right? Mm -hmm. And in many places, there's no international response, right? It's only locals who are responding. Mm -hmm. So somehow we put ourselves as a center 
as international actors, but we're not. If it's a drop in the ocean, what we do. So let's put ourselves into a bit moderate position. Mm -hmm. um, so Ruti, I think. Can I, can I just quickly ask you on one point you mentioned before we maybe deep dive a bit more into the localization issue? Um, yeah. You mentioned the tsunami experience, and for many, indeed, that has been a key background regarding um, the run up to, to the summit and why an ambitious reform agenda is needed. So, um, what would you say? Um, there have been at least two schools uh, in the run up to the summit. Do we look at um, a humanitarian system which needs really fundamental change, as some governments believed and uh, local representatives indeed did as well? Or do we look at an fairly effective humanitarian system which surely needs some reforms, which, for example, was rather the stake of um, the German government? What has been your view? Okay, so, you know, for me, um, as I said, I've been in this system for a long time. I've seen a lot of reform processes in the humanitarian system, uh, in the aid system. And it seems that we are tinkering at the edges <laughs> and somehow we're not getting there. So I think there, there, is, there is a need for a, a fundamental thinking, rethinking um, in some aspects, because we know, and I, I think, you know, in your report, you also point out, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement has really brought into frame some fundamental attitudes and behaviors that need to change. Because without that change, I don't think that anything will change. Um, so I think that and the whole uh, movement around decolonization of aid is really um, helping, uh, should be helping us to think in a new way of how we respond. So I think there are some um, things where we need fundamental change. There are others where, you know, we can work with what we have while the change is happening because, uh, you know, you cannot just break everything overnight, otherwise things will not work. Mm -hmm. And when there is an emergency, what will we do? And I think COVID situation has shown us that, right? I mean, if I look at what's happening in India and other places around the world right now, um, you know, international help is needed, the, the funding is needed uh, to local level. Uh, but right now, that, that is still not working. Um, so we need to, to work in a way uh, to make sure that this, you know, this, the blockages that are there, um, there is a, uh, there's a positive attitude to change. And I think sometimes it's about the mind shift. I think um, in, in your report, you also talk about this. But, you know, if we are always um, talking about, oh, we want to do this, but, and there's always a but, right? That, that means, you know, humanitarians are meant to be innovative. They're, you're supposed to be finding solutions. So let's not have any more buts, but let's have a can-do attitude, right, and behavior. Mm -hmm. I think the second thing is, for me, um, you know, humanitarian response is about solidarity. And how are we showing solidarity? And um, I think over the years, I've seen such bureaucratization of our systems. And I think that needs to change. How do we show more solidarity from the heart? And really, you know, um, looking at how we can make this easier for ourselves. Because I see and I work with people in the system and I can also see the stress levels, right, of people who are working in the system. The well-being of, uh, you know, of people in the system is being affected. So how do we make sure that we really de some of these things? And I think the last one I will say is the a bit of the will to change because um, as you said, uh, Ralph, you know, there's been a lot of change processes in the past, but where is that will? Uh, and this is not only for one uh, level, right? So the donors need to do something about changing. They have to have the will to change. The INGOs and the international actors, the UN system, they have to have the will to change. And then I'm not going to live out, I mean, local actors also have to do their bit, right? Um, they have to show the good stewardship as well. And so we have to work together to make that change. Um, I don't think it's just uh, something for one actor or another. I, I think one of the things that would really make a difference is really 
uh, having a bit more uh, deeper conversation. I feel like we're always just surfacing, uh, the, the scratching the surface. What I've seen through the grand bargain process is that there are a lot of pilots, right? They have been um, as projects um, that have been instituted. Um, there's lots of research. I think a global mentoring initiative has published about, there's about 14 pages of bibliography just for research on localization. But what I see is the plane has not taken off. We remain grounded. So, what is you know what, what is the value of, of those pilots? We have to. So, the donors have to keep an eye on that as well. What are they funding and how effective they are? Uh, because somehow we need the longer term uh, vision. And I think I would say that going forward for the grand bargain, uh, five years. If you talk about change process, it's not enough. And now I hear that. Uh, we are thinking about two years. So I think we need, uh, just like the, you know, the um, SDGs, we're talking about 2030. Uh, if you look at, you know, the Sendai framework is 2030. We need to have a longer term process that really looks at, um, you know, mm the changes that need to be done. So let's mm. think a bit longer term. Mm. Um, that this ad hoc approach is, is not working. Mm. So we need to, I think we need to really reflect on that. Um, Smriti, can I quickly uh, yeah. come in on a point you mentioned? Um, before we maybe analyze a bit deeper, um, what is the reason why we don't progress faster than we hoped for? And why are so many actors still on the brakes as you analyze? And why don't we don't go beyond the pilot level as also our chart paper, which we just published on the grant bargain confirms. Mm -hmm. um, what would you say if you look at localization itself, uh, what could be a key step or, or what is an, an even anecdotal evidence? Um, why are things going wrong? There is always the talk about funding, at least 25% of the funding should go to locals. Of course, it hardly happens. Only 10 donors so far, more or less, um, have um, really accomplished. Um, but what would be the key step from your point of view like uh, to be taken in the next one or two years? And maybe then we look at it a bit more and why, why we progress so slowly. Um, I think the key part is um, we, we get too much focused on the percentage of funding. I think the, the focus on equitable relationship Uh, power. We, we haven't even come to the whole discussion on power in this system. And I think that that's where the key lies, because unless we start talking about that and really looking at what does equitable relationship look like, where decisions are made together, because unless those decisions are made together about what's appropriate um, mm -hmm. at country level, um, I think we are, we are missing the trick. So I think that these two things are, are really important. Um, I also think that um, looking at more um, also local funding or other types of funding um, which can be unlocked where the local actors are also, because INGOs and the UN system, they have big machinery on, on fundraising, uh, but I think this is not available for local actors. So how can we do more for them to be able to access those funds? Um, and, and I think that if we, if we really recognize, uh, because I often get this uh, feedback from people, oh, there is capacity deficit, mm -hmm. please stop that. There is no capacity deficit. Yes, there are some places where the technical capacity is missing, but actually, if we have the long, wrong glasses on, we'll never see the capacity. I, I saw that in the tsunami um, response. So we need to recognize, we've been training people for many years. Where is, you know, where is the effectiveness of your training and capacity building all these years? Mm -hmm. um, I've seen these in budgets in many, many organizations. So, you know, collectively, what have we built if we are still talking about capacity gap? So maybe we also need to look at that. Um, and I think um, two things. The collective capacity, I think you mentioned a bit earlier, we keep looking at individual stuff, right? But collectively, it doesn't go very far because we are all competing with each other. If I see um, 
in any response, and I'm now going to talk about the Rohingya response, all these international actors are competing with each other for funding for Rohingya response. And in that fight, local organizations and local capacities being left out, um, we need to really focus on where is that capacity? How do we, um, how do we uh, reinforce that? And I think one of the phrases for, uh, from the grant bargain was, reinforce not replace so so let's get focused on that and and really work on that to to augment that capacity i think one of the other things is in many um western countries right institutions matter and you know if we don't provide institutional support to local organizations so they have a a strong organization that can cope with this, I think we, again, we are missing the trick. It's no good just giving them technical capacity, which then they can't maintain afterwards, because many of them had, um, you know, uh, capacity trainings over the past years, but they lose their staff because there's not, um, you know, they cannot maintain the staff. They cannot maintain their, uh, you know, their infrastructure because they're not getting the overhead. So core cost that's required. So there are all these different things that we can make changes on uh, to, to really, um, you know, to move forward. Mm -hmm. Uh, before we uh, enter um, maybe in more detail discussion also on the actors themselves, uh, when you kindly join our panel in a minute with um, a top donor representative and a top INGO representative, um, that will be a really interesting topic, I believe. Maybe for now, if you could take a look at, um, uh, there is the issue of, is this about individual behavior, about better communication and exchange and attitudes, and to which way is it a systematic issue and a change um, policy issue? Um, some people say, well, this system can't change from within. And I, I am happy to quote, for example, the network ALNAP in 2016, um, analyzing there are powerful organizational incentives for retaining the current system. The system is tied to funding and the top-down system is felt to serve the interests of the people at the top. So what's your hope? How can this change and from where could change be initiated in a more forceful way um, you hope for? I think it's time, um, the demand from the ground, <laughs> it has to be, right? Um, so the demand from the ground um, can also make that change. Um, of course, the donors are key part of this um, equation as well. And um, how, they are, um, how they are providing funding um, and how they are making decisions which um, which affects system, you know system wide uh, approach that's really important because often when there there is a um, when there is a crisis um, there are operational decisions made at local level but um, there's no not a collective decision which for example if you collective made a decision between those donors right. Uh, that actually we have to fund in a way that supports localization, then that will happen. Uh, but right now, that there's a, I think there's a very disjointed way of operating. We have good initiatives like the Good uh, Humanitarian Donorship Initiative and other things, but how are those donors coming together to have a bit more, uh, yeah, strategic approach to this is 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 really really important. Um, and then, of course, you know, how are they actually making that accountable? Because what we see is there are many of these uh, commitments that are made left, right, and center, but there's no accountability. Um, this, you know, how are they being accountable for the commitments they've made and reporting on them? that so the local actors can see that there is an action and make them accountable from and this is why i say uh, you know it's really important to have local actors at the table and the demand from the ground uh, for that accountability because all this action is taking part in their countries um we are a guest when we arrive so can we behave as a guest rather than a master i i, I think this is what i mean by behavior and attitude change uh you know yeah. we often have very dominating attitudes and behaviors. Uh, if we were a bit more humble, and we, if we were really working from the heart in terms of solidarity, we would go there to really think about how can we help rather than uh, you know, um, take over. And that's what I've seen in, in many different countries where I have 
been part of the response mm. in in the ngo sector right mm. uh, so i've seen that from the ground mm. uh, so i think that 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 attitude and behavior of the donors um you know our donor administration looking internally have you you know put the mirror to themselves to say what are their attitudes and behaviors uh, often i see deficit thinking right um or lack of trust when they when it when they talk about um local actors there's a lot of negative narratives about distrust about risk and all of this well you know the risk we know exists in every place and you know the the recent um, reports on psc and others we know that corruption and things happen even in ngos and un agencies right and when that happens there it's big time because they have much much more money than local organization yet it's the local organizations who always get penalized penalized or stigmatized on this mm. so i think we need to change that um it's really time for that step change in terms of our attitudes mm. and behaviors many thanks ruti maybe final question for this round um, if you look at the grant bargain process itself um, to which extent has that been inclusive also with respect to Global South representatives? I mean, there have been uh, 10 times more signatories um, from the international world than um, from the local one and uh, not that much openness to invite more actors from the Global South, I recall. But is that your impression? Mm -hmm. If you've been in the process yourself, uh, how, how did that reflect in the discussions and in the process? Um, why has that been an issue? So look, um, so the run up to the WHS and when the, um, you know, the grand bargain, uh, or actually the, the consultations really was an open process where there were a lot of local organization involved. And suddenly when the, the signatories, of, when the actual bargain was formed, there were no local organizations really involved in there. And I think that, that, that was a big mistake. Um, and once it was formed and the signatories, I think that whole process Uh, even now, if you look at the governance of the, the grand bargain, it's only international organizations. There are no local actors present in the governance, the facilitation group. I think going forward, that needs to be democratized and more local organizations need to be represented there. Um, I think the second one is that um, often, and, and this just carries on, right, often, Even to get invited to some of these processes, it's internationals who are making decisions on which local actor can be at the table. And I think that's also a, a problem because mm -hmm. it means that it's always the international deciding who can be at the table and how they can participate, how much they can participate. Um, look, in the chart for change process, uh, where we have signatories, Uh, we also made sure that, you know, we have endorsers at the same, you know, the partners need to be at the table because if otherwise it's one-sided, it's about, you know, I'm the judge and the jury. If I'm the one who's making commitments and I'm the one who's reporting, who's there to, to contest that? Who's there to verify actually this is happening or not? We need local actors at the table because The money is in, raised in the name of the populations where the, uh, you know, where the these crises are happening. Money is not for just the organizations, right? If you are raising money and funds in the name of the local populations, then their representatives need to be at the table to make those decisions. I mean, for me, that's the bottom line. It's your accountability. Uh, and we need to democratize uh, a lot of these processes. Even in the, you know, when I see the work streams, we have a lot of local actors now because we've pushed for it, right? Um, in the localization work stream. But what about the other work streams? Uh, they're still all dominated by international actors. And I think for the, going forward, we really need to make sure the facilitation group at every level, there must be local representation. Um, and, you know, people always say, oh, but, you know, there's so many local organizations, who do we pick? Well, you know, how do you make decisions? There are many INGOs in, in all, all places but you come together and you make decisions mm. about who will represent. It's the same, leave it for the local actors also to have the same processes. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, 
Um, the other thing I always get here, and I, I get really irritated by this is, oh, but you know, you're also fragmented. Well, I'm sorry to say this. I have been in the international system for many years and international actors are very fragmented. If you see the same organizations in different initiatives and they have different views you know, in, in those initiatives. So um, let's make sure that we're not using double standards, right? Okay. One rule for you and one rule for the local organizations. Let's just reflect on that. And mm. I, I also want to say this about the humanitarian standards, the humanitarian principles, because what I often hear is, um, you know, lecturing local organizations about humanitarian standards, but, you know, we see, and local organizations very often see, that donors right now are not adhering to their principles, and uh, neither are, uh, you know, international actors in the way they're actually getting their funding, because we know there are some political motivations around these fundings as well. Um, we, we see this in Syria, we've seen this in, in many other places in the Palestine now. So, you know, on one hand, they're giving the humanitarian aid, but they're not, um, I think that whole thing about, you know, reducing the need, part of the grand bargain, is, is nowhere to be seen, right? So where is that political action and standing up for the rights of people? You know, when you, when you are funding a humanitarian operation, but at the same time, you're weaponizing uh, some actors who actually perpetrate violence against the population. Well, mm -hmm. that's not showing mm -hmm. those, uh, you know, standards in practice. So, so I would much. really, going forward, I would like that, you know, really to see how they're practicing the principles. Thank you so much, Smruti. I think that has been a really powerful intro on um, your views and what needs to change. And um, let me take the chance now to share your insights with a top donor, with a former top donor. And if he can agree to uh, various points you made uh, before we, we surely um, re-engage you in the debate and come back also to the localization challenges. Let me introduce to you um, the panel now, following um, quickly uh, naming that um, we will discuss later on with Farida Bena, um, the Sherpa of the IRC, uh, the Grand Bargain, but now turning for a start to Klaus Sörensen. Klaus has been um, the Director General of ECHO, the top donor and humanitarian arm um, for humanitarian assistance of the European Union. He's been in charge until 2016 for, for um, uh, ECHO policies and um, can explain to us from various angles um, uh, today um, engaged with uh, uh, top um, NGO, with NRC, uh, where I think, Klaus, we've just stolen you from the export board meeting and apologies to NRC for that but many thanks for joining us welcome Klaus <laughs> thank you for having me Ralph it's a delight to be to be with you and uh, wonderful to see Smoothie again uh, thank you, Klaus. really nice to have you uh, in the in the panel Klaus um, uh, you heard uh, you want me to react or Ralph over to you Yes, please, um, Klaus, you, you heard Smruti's point of views and she talked a lot about donors. Maybe if you want to quickly comment on that before we take maybe a step back and ask uh, what has been your um, background when you engaged very much in the run-up to the World Humanitarian Summit and in the pre-processes and why you believed major reforms needed. But uh, maybe you want to comment on Smruti for a start. No, just, just, just. I, I mean, first of all, I would love to come to a gathering in the global south and be the guest, and uh, and uh, uh, Smoochie would be the master. So, uh, and I, I really, I really appreciate what she says uh, that we have too many buts, and we should move into a can-do mode. Uh, so, so uh, uh, agreement on that. The attitude of donors. Um, uh, has not been necessarily very helpful. I, I have to say that uh, the Trump years uh, has meant that we actually didn't know where we had the Americans. Let's be very honest about it. So a lot of others were sort of playing a little bit for time, what goes on, et cetera, et cetera. I think in that period, actually, Ralph, uh, uh, we can criticize, but the German government, for one, was one that stepped up and also put more money into the system. 
But if you look at it sort of globally, there was a reluctance to be super ambitious because we didn't know where the, the thing was going. This is not an excuse. It's just giving you a bit of context. And, um, and uh, as this period went on, uh, we realized, a lot of people realized that we had to give much more power to the recipients or to the beneficiary countries. We had to engage more. The question is how to do it. And then we're back to a number of the issues that I'm sure we will discuss more in detail in this, in this panel. So um, pressure from the ground, indeed, most welcome, most welcome. And I think what Mark Lowcock wants to do also with his group, uh, although we have many, too many, sometimes too many groups uh, to, to dig into accountability and to make sure that the voice of the beneficiaries actually is channeled up as, a, as a powerful motivation uh, that that voice is, is heard loud and clear. Um, but perhaps, uh, Ralph, you mentioned the background, uh, and maybe it's boring <laughs> for the audience, but, but I, I could give a very fast rundown of the, and the, of the situation before the Istanbul summit and why I was actually very much in favor of having that summit. Uh, you know where we were in 2015. Uh, we had the uh, financing for development conference in Addis Ababa. We had the SDGs that were replacing the Millennium Development Goals, uh, also in 15, and we actually had the Paris Climate Summit. So <laughs> we had we had uh, SDGs which are addressed both to developing countries and to industrialized countries because it's an agenda for all of us. We have financing that we know will go, of course, to developing countries, but mainly to those that can absorb, not necessarily to the weakest. And then we have the climate agenda, which again is a global agenda. So I said to myself, where are, where is the conference for the weakest of the weakest? Where, where, where is it? Why, why have, have the most destitute people, the bottom 10% of the world population, why have they slipped off the radar? And, and that is why, even if it was not a UN intergovernmental conference, and we had huge problems, huge problems in getting the UN system actually to, to support this process, because there were the usual uh, uh, bad boys in Venezuela and in Sudan, and et cetera, et cetera, blocking, et cetera. And it gave problems. It gave problems during the conference that there was not complete buy-in but nevertheless, even in hindsight, I believe it was the right thing to do. So everything is imperfect. Everything can be improved. But not having had that conference would actually have put the humanitarian below climate and below sustainable development in general. And this, I, I, could, not, I could not accept that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember meetings in Washington. It was uh, during the Obama and they said, why, the, why do you want that? They knew that there would be problems up in New York with uh, the global, uh, um, some of the G77, etc. So I said, listen, guys, now we just go for it. And in the end, it, it happened. So five years on, Klaus, in our talk last time, you said, if you look at the results, you are upset. Why are you upset? Well, I'm, that's my character. <laughs> that's my character. That's a good start. I'm, I'm um, always a little bit. I'm uh, sure there's more yeah, to it. Yeah, no, I, nothing, nothing is good enough. But I, I think I hope, hopefully, it will translate it into energy. No, I am, I am, uh, I, I want to say also that the grand bargain has to be read in conjunction with the high-level panel on financing for humanitarians, because the grand bargain is the third leg of that agenda. One was to shrink the needs. That means that we have to act preventively, right? So it's an exodus, it's developing funding, etc. The other is to widen the resource base. So that's Islamic finance, it's a, a, a blended finance, it's a private donors, it's also our humanitarian budgets. And then uh, we talk about more efficiency and the grand bargain was absolutely necessary because uh, just as Muti said, we can see when we go to the field that the taxpayer's money goes through a number of processes that do not really land where they have to land. So the agenda, in my view, was well-structured, 
well thought out. We had all the elements. Um, and, but then we ran into this period, uh, and I was very unhappy that the Kristalina Georgieva <laughs> had to go to, 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 to the International Monetary Fund. I'm very happy the, for them. The they former EU commissioner, woman. just to explain. Exactly, and she was the eminent person. She was the first eminent person, and she pushed a lot. But, but if you have a huge job like that coming on you, it's just not easy to hurt the cats and to create the po political momentum. Mm -hmm. She did what she could do. And Sigrid Karg, splendid person, uh, obviously uh, suffering under the uh, fact that we have an American amb amb administration that is basically not really engaged in all of that, uh, also had a limited scope for, for action. So in a way, I believe now we have the conditions for a reset. We have a condition for looking at what has been done. And that's why I looked at what has been done. And I'm happy with definitely with certain items. I'm happy for transparency. I am fairly happy with cash. But so cash has been rolled out widely, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I have to say on cash, I'm also uh, furious that the UN system has not yet found out who is the main agency responsible for that. So th there's work to be done. I'm annoyed that we haven't found ways to engage the local responders more. I know that there are legal issues, there are bureaucratic issues, but with a political will to solve them, you can overcome them. And we can discuss that uh, a little bit later in how that should be done. Mm. So you can go through uh, the whole list of deliverables and you will see a glass half full, half empty. Sometimes you will see more of an empty glass. Sometimes you will see that it's, it's not so bad on the transparency and so on. But my advice is don't throw the baby out with the bathing water. Don't, don't give up and, and, and don't get distracted by just focusing on, let's say, localization, which is very close to my heart. But not, let's not make that an excuse for not solving the problem of reporting, uh, the, the solving the legal problem, solving the issue of multi-sector needs assessments where uh, agencies have to cooperate in, in getting all of this done. Hmm. Because if we, if we get distracted, we, we miss an opportunity and the opportunity has to be seized now. Many thanks, Klaus. Um, uh, we come back to this later. If, if you um, don't mind, I would um, invite now Farida Bena to join the discussion and then link you, you guys up. Um, welcome, Farida. Uh, many thanks for joining us. You are for 20 years in the sector. You are the humanitarian policy lead of uh, the International Rescue Committee since 2017 and you are the Sherpa for the Grand Bargain um, um, for years, so you know it all by heart. Um, IRC has published, I believe today, a statement on uh, the Grand Bargain and um, you have major asks to share. Maybe we could start with that. Welcome, Farida. Please let us know um, Thank how you Thank you. Thank you very much for having me and it's a pleasure to meet you all. Uh, yes, I mean, later today we are uh, publishing our position paper on the future of the Grand Bargain. Uh, in which we echo many of the messages that Klaus and Sruti have just uh, said. So I can only agree with what has been said so far. And specifically, uh, we agree with uh, the direction of travel that the Grand Bargain 2.0, so to speak, is taken, that is to um, zero in on localization and uh, quality funding. Uh, for the next iteration of the, the grand bargain. But we also suggest a number of recommendations to really go deeper and make sure that in the next two year period, we really secure the political um, agreement at principles level. Um, some of the challenges that uh, Smruti and Klaus uh, mentioned really have to do with the fact that, that since 2016, uh, when the Grand Bargain was first established, many of the principles, by which I mean um, heads of agencies, CEOs of NGOs, uh, really the top decision makers, have been largely absent 
from grand bargain discussions, leaving it to their technical teams and sometimes the different, if not competing teams uh, to uh, address huge challenges at the technical level. So we have done a lot of technical work. Some of it is excellent. I, I agree that we shouldn't throw away the baby with the bathwater. Uh, but there's only so much that technical experts can discuss and agree uh, without their bosses at the table. We haven't seen those bosses. Even you know, Sherpas like me can only go so far. But what we really need is to identify now the most promising reforms and really gather the principles at the table and ask them to discuss and select, negotiate some of these reforms. And if uh, at that point there is no agreement, there is still no agreement, then we have to ask ourselves, why uh, is that? Um, you know, I take the example of cash that Klaus has just mentioned. Excellent work has been done at the technical level. What really needs to happen now is a political agreement on a global cash coordination mechanism. Why hasn't it been agreed in this five years, in the last five years? That's a question that needs to be asked. Mm -hmm. And I would, uh, would guess that it's not just because of legal issues, bureaucratic issues, but probably because the top decision makers haven't really come to the table haven't really uh, engaged with each other across constituencies, across work streams, and had a, a very open dialogue uh, about what they can and cannot do. Mm. So I hope that the next uh, two year period will really help us identify those transformative reforms. And you know there cannot be 20, 30, but maybe we can start with two, three, five reforms that could really have a domino effect mm -hmm. on the other issues that uh, the grand bargain has mm -hmm. addressed so far. But it really all starts uh, with a higher level political engagement mm -hmm. that brings the principles of each signatory back mm -hmm. to the negotiating table. Right. Farina, and once that decision, just to finish, sorry, sure. once that decision has been taken, then it has to be cascaded to each, um, each team working at the technical level. Because what's happened before is that uh, some decisions were taken by uh, the wrong team or the whole organization, the, the signatory as a whole, as an organization, as an agency, was not on board with some mm -hmm. of the technical work that mm -hmm. has been done. Mm -hmm. When you get the top decision makers to agree, then you also expect them to instruct mm -hmm. all of the organization to follow suit, mm -hmm. which hasn't happened until now. Mm -hmm. Farida, can I ask you on, on one point, um, um, basically all three of you indicated that individual behavior is a key issue and you mentioned, well, you need the right people on the table and they really need to agree on reform, need to agree on reform issues. Um, at the same time, I mean, if you look uh, at the donor side for a start, the government donor side for a start, Uh, aren't there also conflicting goals? Um, aren't there like um, objectives to say, well, we want more and more accountability, we want more and more visibility, what has happened with the taxpayers' money? And at the same time, studies of IRC, for example, highlight how far more flexible f uh, funding is helpful, how if you trust agencies and provide funds, they can invest the way they know from the ground is the best way and the most effective way, that that would help much more. So isn't this also in a conflict conflicting issue that um, there is uh, a misunderstanding and maybe even conflicting political objectives um, on more accountability in terms of uh, uh, understood uh, political accountability taxpayers one and more trust in INGOs to do the right thing. Absolutely. There is an inherent tension. Um, and I would also say because there is one major factor that um, is invisible at times, but really does impact on our decisions and donor decisions, which is mm -hmm. risk. So mm -hmm. we tend to work in some of the most dangerous places in the world in conflict situations. So although we take the maximum care to avoid any sort of mismanagement, um, as the 
the funding goes down the transaction chain, we are asked to be um, more and more compliant with donor guidelines, with uh, stringent um, compliance requirements, while at the same time also transferring the funding that we receive. Mm -hmm. This, there is also a risk that needs to be taken into account. What happens mm -hmm. now is that risk is transferred down the transaction chain when in fact it should be shared more equitably between donors and recipients. Mm -hmm. So we do want to be accountable. We, we go the extra mile to be accountable and report back. We also need donors to share the risk mm -hmm. of operating in such a dangerous environments. And usually what happens is that the recipients have to bear the cost of managing this risk mm -hmm. while also being more and more accountable. So we do mm -hmm. need to acknowledge that there is an inherent tension between accountability risk sharing and uh, flexibility of funding. Mm -hmm. uh, we have mm -hmm. to find the balance uh, and communicate it to the taxpayers in a way that they, um, they can understand without using jargon. Right. And that also is something that starts with an open political discussion mm -hmm. at principles right. level. And Farida, can I ask you, it, it might also come like a systematic disincentive come into play. If I link, link you up with um, the, the asks of Smruti and the call for much more um, localization, much more power to the really local partners uh, on the ground. Um, if we take the example of INGOs or of IRC, um, the quota for 25% funding going to local partners in uh, 2021 won't be achieved by IRC. Um, what is the reason for that. I understand it's pretty well below. Why, why is it so difficult to engage? And uh, do you really feel there are incentives for international NGOs to play a different role in future, as we will discuss in the second panel also in more detail? Yes, absolutely. And the paper we are going to publish later today addresses this issue very clearly. We have done quite a lot on localization. Uh, but our work is clearly not yet done. So we are using this paper and the um, renewal of the grand bargains mandate to actually recommit to uh, our 25% localization commitment. Um, we know that we are behind, but we are willing to recommit. Starting this year, for example, IRC has doubled um, the, um, I'm sorry, it has increased its funding to local actors by 50% compared to 2020. That's a commitment. Mm -hmm. We are also committing to uh, building strategic partnership with local partners and half of them will be women-led organizations. Uh, we are taking also a commitment to report uh, on our own funding to um, Sec, so-called second level recipients, our local mm -hmm. partners to the financial tracking service uh, mm -hmm. by 2024 or earlier. Um, and this is a major step for us because to be able to report on these, on these financial flows, we mm -hmm. have to centralize our administrative and financial systems, which is a huge step. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're taking all the steps internally to harmonize what is usually now done at country level. And that is also, may I add, something that is invisible to donors. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. somehow expected that organizations centralize these systems. It takes uh, quite a lot of uh, resources to do this, mm -hmm. but we want to recommit and send a signal that we are ready as IRC to do our part to make sure that in the next iteration there is progress on mm -hmm. localization. Right. And okay. let me just add also, I agree very much with, with Rutik that uh, it's not just about uh, funding. Um, when it comes to localization, we're actually talking about power. And that to us means sharing resources, but also sharing expertise sharing decision-making, making sure that our local partners not only are in the room, but um, also have a decision-making, a co-chairing, a senior function at the mm -hmm. table. Mm 
Right. Many thanks, Farida. Because uh, ahead of linking you guys a little bit up between the three of you, maybe um, in a minute we could uh, jump a bit to Nicoline, our graphic designer, and take a look what um, she has already noted down. Um, but maybe ahead of that, um, uh, Klaus, in one minute, if you hear the asks for, for the donor side uh, from IRC, who is, has uh, published so profound studies on how much uh, more impactful uh, multi-year funding is, that the taxpayers' money is really paying off much better, etc. What would you say from your background, what is the key issue uh, blocking donors really to engage on a broader scale to provide it? Not even half of the, the government donors um, have uh, provided 30% uh, multi-year funding in 2020, as they promised. And what, what's the reason for that? Um, I, I think, I think uh, the humanitarian departments uh, should hire uh, some lawyers that understand the financial regulations of their own fiscal system, because very often the barrier is that the budget uh, authorities, the ministries of finance, or in the European Union, the uh, director general for budget, they say you cannot do uh, multi-year commitments because we work with annual budgets and so on. And because we are nice and sweet and we have a big heart, we're not always good at negotiating with these guys and say, listen, we just want to give a long-term commitment of a political nature, which you actually do very often in all our national systems, when you want to build the motorway, you don't give the money just for the first year. You, you say you get the money year by year, but by the way, the motorway would take five years to build. So it's not nuclear science, but I feel a lot of bureaucratic uh, mess around all of this. And I completely agree with Farida that this, this needs leadership. It needs people to say, I want this done. Tell me where are the blocking factors? Because I don't think it's political. I think it's actually <laughs> it's actually administrative, and the technical people cannot sort that out. Mm -hmm. That's right. But might it be a political issue? As I understand, you there is a lack of leverage from the humanitarian world um, into the regular uh, political units in, uh, for example, the European, the German government um, to make their stake and to build alliances. Yeah, sure, there is, and uh, and my my feeling is that actually actually it's not so complicated. You have to talk, you have to engage, you have to go to the Ministry of Finance, you have to sit down, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, I must say, I did that uh, when we negotiated our financial regulation. I didn't manage to get the multi-year, but I managed to get an escape clause, so at least we could do two years. And, uh, and also, uh, we could uh, take decisions much faster than anybody else in the system. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the same with visibility. A lot of people, they say, ah, we don't get enough visibility uh, because we finance uh, this UN uh, organization and they don't want, et cetera, et cetera. This is also nonsense because if you explain to the UN agency that if you get the money from a donor, obviously that donor would want to be proud of what is going on. But it has to be organized. It has to be explained. And that takes a bit of time. And again, it's leadership from the top mm -hmm. that has to make this happen. Mm -hmm. You cannot just do it uh, by sitting in Geneva uh, mm -hmm. with some uh, very capable but nevertheless, junior people. Hmm. Many thanks, Klaus. Uh, maybe we have a chance to take a quick look um, on the progress Nicoline is doing on the graphic uh, designing. If we have a chance to share the screen and to see if Klaus comments, for example, have been reflected there already in South Africa by Nicoline. And um, there is already a lot going on. So um, please take a quick look. Um, uh, in the meantime, I take the chance for a final question to um, Smruti. Um, Smruti, um, what we hear from colleagues um, sounds um, also encouraging in a way. I mean, if it's about um, individuals coming together, if it's more about political will, about maybe political um, setups changing, for example, in the, in the US, it sounds more hopeful than many others um, would have probably shared with us. Um, would you agree that there is hope and that it's um, worthwhile um, investing a couple of more years in this grand bargain process? So there's always hope. We can't live without hope for a start. 
Um, I think yes, and I think there needs to be a longer term process. I think we are too short sighted and we are, you know, always thinking of two years, five years, and we know that change takes longer than that. Yes, we need to have goals of two years, five years, but we need to think much longer term. But most importantly, and, and just listening to both Freda and Klaus, one of the biggest issue is, you know, um, we are often told that, oh, it's the public, our taxpaying public who, you know, doesn't want to take it. They don't even know what's happening with your money, right? You know, if they knew that it cost you three times as much uh, to do a response in, uh, directly to when you're working with your partners, then, and that their money can go further, are they going to say no? I don't think so. You know, everybody wants to make most of the money. So I also think there is this thing about communicating, right? Communicating with the tax giving public about this, because I just don't think that there is enough uh, that understanding about how the partners come in. Actually, uh, if you look at it around the world, it's the partners who are doing most of the work. They don't get credit, they don't get visibility, which donor is asking, right? It's donor's responsibility also to ask those questions, put in those, um, you know, the reporting requirements, which shows that there is a quality partnership going on. It's not a one way street, right? So, you know, they, I do think donors have responsibility to make sure that the international partners, I understand all your legal requirements, right? But when you are giving money to an ING or UN agency, make sure that they are, you know, working in equitable partnership with your local organization. That's your duty and responsibility, I think. Um, so I would say that, you know, there's a, quite a lot of room for improvement in that area. Um, you know, um, just, just making that space. One thing that I often get and hear from local actors is we never get to have, you know, have direct conversation with donors. It's always via via. And we know that things get lost in translation. So yeah. I think we need to make room for having direct conversation between donors and local partners. You mm -hmm. have to have that regularly to inform yourself and make them feel that they are at the table with donors, right? Mm -hmm. we, they understand that, you know, there is sometimes need for intermediaries. That, don't get me wrong, but it doesn't mean that only, they can only communicate via the intermediaries. I think that is an issue because then you're not hearing the real issues from local organizations. Mm -hmm. Look, um, I think that this whole discussion has given real opportunity for lo local actors to speak up. And we've seen them more vocal than before, which is great, right? But we also know that there is backlash against some of the ones who speak out. Uh, the ones who are vocal about some of these issues, uh, you know, um, they have their, you know, funding withdrawn, their sideline in processes and all of this. This is happening now. We keep talking about accountability, right? We keep talking about PSA and other things. So this for me is also power abuse, right? right. Uh, when you retaliate against local actors who speak out. So we actually have to keep that also in the radar. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. I think make an environment free of that kind of harassment <laughs> and local actors will be at the table and really contributing. This is one of the reasons also why Sometimes when I at the table, they may not speak out because they're too afraid to lose their funding or lose their, mm. you know, their space at the table. Right. So Many thanks. Can we just also think about that? Many thanks, Ruti. We come back to you in a minute when we share what we've heard in the chat, and Andrea will join me in a second. Um, in the meantime, Farida, um, maybe a final comment from your side. What would be the key change, the key ask from your side to um, change the setup as it is not right now, to change the roles uh, between donors, intermediaries, INGOs, and locals? What would be your key ask if you can put it in a phrase? Well. If I could just summarize it, I would say focus on the front lines on a number of levels in terms of localization. We've just said it. We heard it from Smoothie, from uh, Klaus. Um, we really need to um, support 
the main actors of change who are the local partners on the ground. They are the primary responders. And we should recognize as a humanitarian community that we are there to support them, to, to add value to existing systems and capacity. Um, the other major change that needs to happen is that we need to flip the humanitarian financing model again on its head. Right now, two thirds of all humanitarian assistance uh, go through uh, UN agencies. And while this is good for coordination purposes and also makes life easier for a lot of bilateral donors, what happens is that that 65, 66% of humanitarian assistance is sometimes bottled up in UN bureaucracy and takes months, as we experienced the last year with the COVID response, to trickle down to the front lines. And in many cases, IRC, but also our partners have ended up waiting eight months until they've started receiving UN funding, pass-through funding. In a situation like COVID, this has had uh, incredibly negative consequences, as we all know and witness. Mm. This can no longer happen. COVID has only exacerbated uh, a, a trend that we have seen since the grand bargain was first established, which is that uh, humanitarian needs are far outpacing humanitarian funding. And if we don't prioritize reaching the frontline implementers, be they local actors, the primary responders, international organizations, or a partnership of the two, we are going to continue to experience funding that is short-term to address long-term um, challenges. Um, funding that is not good enough because it's not of good quality, it's not flexible, and funding that is not fast enough. Mm -hmm. So we really need to address the volume, the quality, the speed of funding if we want to see mm -hmm. uh, major reforms happening in the grand bargain. And I hope that this second iteration, whether it's two year, five year long, is really going to tackle this crucial issue. We mm -hmm. need to flip the humanitarian financing model on its head. Many thanks, Farida, for your clear and straightforward uh, words. Um, um, now, Andrea will join me, who has monitored the chat, and um, so the audience should um, have a say, and I am make a bit space for Andrea. And um, don't be surprised, um, and don't blame me, by the way, to keep looking a bit down at you. The screen is a bit down, and that's uh, why the camera is far more up. And it's the hottest day in Germany for about eight months, so that's why we keep sweating here. Sorry for that. Andrea, what's <laughs> all going on in the chat? Thank you, Ralf. Um, <laughs> the chat is very, very lively. <laughs> We're very happy for an, an engaged discussion. Um, as always, it starts right now, so uh, please bear with me. I'm trying to uh, cluster um, all the questions that have been asked so far. I think the um, best frame that um, I could locate was uh, the intersection between quantitative and qualitative engagement. Um, it's a question that relates to most of the points that have been made by Smuti, Klaus and, and Farida in terms of solidarity versus bureaucratization or Klaus's uh, saying of not throwing the baby uh, out with the bathwater or um, Farida's comment on the cash work stream um, being uh, excellently um, um, implemented in a technical way, but the political level is, is still missing. So Rajan Jimire uh, from Malteser International asked um, the question, one issue also observed uh, is that the grand bargain has looked more on quantitative measures, such as how much fund funding channeled and how many NGOs trained on a, te on a technical area. We have missed the qualitative measures such as relationship, engagement, trust, leadership within country level and local level, um, and the whole humanitarian architecture. So I think this is a comment that relates to uh, most of your questions and comments and also where you might uh, have a little bit of an, a disagreement among you. So this is the first uh, um, impulse I want to give into the round. and. Um, I will come back later with more questions. Okay. Many thanks, Andrea. Um, well, um, Sruti, would you like to jump on that one? <laughs> okay. Um, 
so, so two, two things that kind of strikes me. Um, one of them is really, uh, when I was listening earlier, um, the competition. So, you know, the competition in the system and the, the incentive by the donors in the way that, you know, the IDODI and others are competing for funding. So that kind of, that sets the kind of, uh, the mindset of expansion, right? Um, and what I see is a, a lot of the organization, if I, if I look at the directors of organizations, how are they, um, how are they, uh, you know, assessed? It's by them expanding the fund, the, the fund for the organization, right? That's how they're assessed. So that doesn't, uh, that doesn't produce uh, something which looks at, okay, how can we, you know, uh, how can we work so that we are expanding our partner base rather than us, right? Um, and I think at country level, this is so important because we see now international organizations localizing, uh, you know, they're registering at country level and that creates less space for CSOs. I can tell you, we keep talking about that, you know, a healthy democracy needs civil society organizations. Well, we don't let them grow in at the local level. Give them space. You might, you know, take, take less space at the table. So, for example, um, in Bangladesh right now and in some of the other spaces, when I've been there in the coordination mechanism, it's all NGOs, right? Um, maybe some of the NGOs need to step back, make space for local organizations to have their say. They know that environment. They've lived there and they know what's appropriate for them. Mm -hmm. Yes, we can help them. But uh, I think, yeah, you, you also need to think about where you need to step out. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's not happening enough right mm -hmm. now. Many thanks, Ruti. Um, Andrea has at least two more questions to share. So if uh, you guys agree, I would uh, give the floor to Andrea again and then uh, move on and you all will have a final word. So don't be upset, please. Okay, thank you, Ralf. Um, another aspect that has been mentioned in a very... Uh, <laughs> don't get it. <laughs> in a, in An upset, Klaus. Sorry. Okay. So uh, the next aspect I no, want no, to talk no, no, about no, no. is um, the issue of access. Um, Ulrich von Pila asked the question, um, looking back, uh, back at those five years of the Grand Bargain, how would you evaluate the humanitarian access um, to the toughest places? What has improved, meaning where have we gained uh, access where did we did not have access before? And that kind of relates a little bit to another question posted in the chat that, uh, chat that related was related to, uh -huh, localization, is it... Um, who are those local actors? Are we talking about uh, local NGOs? Are we talking about civil society organizations? Are we talking about uh, local authorities? Or what about affected populations that uh, humanitarians need to access? So um, this question is um, circling around the question of access. Mm. Many thanks, Andrea. Um, I think, Farida, to the question of who are the local actors actually and how should they be defined, you might have something to say. But Klaus, be, be reassured, yeah, it will be your turn. Don't worry. Oh. Well, I mean, we have our own uh, in-house definition of local actors and that's, I think, um, another issue with the grand bargain that um, five years on, we still don't have agreed definitions on a number of key concepts like localization, like local actors. It would be good in this next phase to really, again, uh, talk to each other at political level and uh, understand why there hasn't been an agreement on such fundamental notions and concepts that we work with. The 25% um, target also has never been clearly defined. What does humanitarian funding mean? Just, you know, I put it as an aside. Um, but for us, for IRC, local actors are uh, national um, local community-based um, actors, including civil society, but also local authorities, uh, actors that are locally rooted in the country in question. So we're not talking about international organizations registering as local uh, actors. Um, and for us, um, 
this is really important. Um, we we try to to establish these relationships in terms of quantity, and we we are now are embarking on our next strategic plan running until 2033 when IRC turns 100. Um, and we are engaging to develop a number of partnerships every year so that by the end of this period, we're going to have hundreds of local partnerships in place. So we, we are trying to to expand the, the number, the presence of uh, local partners in the countries where we operate. But also, increasingly, we want to develop a better quality of these partnerships. So making sure that we invest, as I said earlier, in women-led organizations, because in all of this, we do want to stress uh, the importance of taking a gender uh, and a gender-based approach. Um, and that is something that I also hope the Grand Bargain 2.0 will um, address more consistently. Mm -hmm. um, and we are going to operate with a long-term perspective. As a matter of fact, we, we tend not to use humanitarian in the way we work because we think this is a siloed approach. We, we talk about outcomes long-term results that benefit the people we work with. And for us, the local actors are primarily partners or local agents of change, whether they partner with us or not. The people that we ultimately serve for us are clients. Uh, we want to use this deliberately provocative term mm -hmm. because we refuse to call them beneficiaries. For us, people, affected populations are really um, the, 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 uh, our ultimate client and we are responsible and accountable to mm -hmm. them and we want to make sure that they are at the center of everything we do from the design to the evaluation of our mm -hmm. programs. Many thanks so for I hope I've answered your question. Many thanks. So maybe yes. a final one from the audience, from Andrea? Yes. Dear Klaus, final um, <laughs> question I have from the audience directly relates to something that you said. It was uh, Arman Navasadian who asked, if German donors don't know where American donors are, what was essentially the role of UN coordinating entities? It kind of relates to something that uh, Simon Mugabe also asked about the role of collaboration um, between all the involved actors, the UN agencies, uh, Red, Cress, Red, Red Cross, Red Crescent movements, and NGOs who were involved. So it's about collect, uh, collaboration and coordination, um, and your comment on the, the fact that um, Germans were not aware of mm. where, where the Americans were during the Trump, Trump mm. um, presidency. Well, I think, I think actually a lot of Germans were aware. <laughs> I think if I look at polling on German attitudes uh, to the Trump administration, it, it, it was very clear that uh, they saw something that the majority didn't really like. Uh, and, and let me be a little bit cynical here and a little bit uh, using a good uh, German word, which is called realpolitik. This agenda will not move unless the Americans are on board. Samantha Power has now been uh, agreed to uh, and nominated. Uh, the European Commission uh, has just published a new policy for humanitarian assistance. Germany, as, as one of the donors that have stepped up while the UK is now drastically cutting back, is a hope that we have to build on, and there are other good donors, and they have to come together. And, and uh, this is in no way questioning the need to go to the front. Of course not. But, 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 but let's, not, let's not be naive. They have to be held to, uh, account, accountable to fulfill the promises made in the grand bargain. And I think, I mean, I just come out of the board meeting, so it's no secret. I think Jan Egeland probably will play a bit of a role in this operation. Uh, let's see what will happen if he is nominated in June. Uh, trust me, we will be able to Im make an impulse and give some dynamism to all of this. Um, so in the front line, I am sure that there are very many methods that have not been adequately explored because it's a little complicated. There is this 
uh, illusion of more corruption, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. One of the things you could do is actually to put more funds in the pool funds, and the pool funds can direct the funding directly to the local actors. Others, INGOs, could team up with locals. And then we have to look at the definition, as Farida was saying. We need to be sure that we're not uh, cheating. It has to be real. But they could partner up and also offer a little bit of the, of the, of the let's say, the trust building that, that the, uh, the donors from the North they want. Mm -hmm. I am confident that we can find a package that can move the agenda forward. Now it's time to get out of the Trump years and implement this. Many thanks, Klaus. So let me jump in because we have to start the final round. We are running out of time, but you have a chance to continue in 10 seconds. Um, final question. A couple of uh, international NGOs published just a statement asking for an extension of the grant bargain until 2030 to align it with the Sustainable Development Goals, Klaus mentioned already. And to be honest, that it's a long-term effort and we need the political momentum and we need the multi-year approach to get this fixed. Would you uh, agree, each of you, that this is a good idea or is this rather repackaging something uh, and um, setting the goal far in the future? Uh, and um, what would be, beyond that, your number one key ask to make the grand bargain still a success? In one minute each, please. Klaus, your call. Oh, you will think about it a minute, or, I... which is fair. No, no, I don't need to think. Uh, I, no, I'm, I'm, actually, I'm actually happy that, that uh, this issue has come up because uh, in some conversations I had over the couple, last weeks, I realized that it would have a lot of benefit to align it with the Sendai framework and with the SDGs. It makes a lot of sense because things are linked. But I would suggest that we nevertheless fix ourselves a two-year uh, reality check Have we had progress? And if we haven't had progress, then we kill the we kill it off. I mean, stop it. I mean, it doesn't. It's not worth it. But but there has to be not only benchmarks on outcomes, but also a timeline. We set ourselves the objective, and we want that implemented by 2023, and we evaluate that. Uh, and then we call the principles. Uh, I completely agree with Farida and also Smoothie that said at the outset we need we need to get the principles involved. And, um, and it, it goes with commissioners, it goes for Samantha Power, it goes for the, the, the top dogs in the agencies, bring them together, bang heads together and say, this is what you have done, congratulations, but this remains to be done, get going. Mm -hmm. Farida, your views? I'm very friendly, as you see. Yes. <laughs> uh, well, Thank you. I, it's hard to, <laughs> to follow what Klaus says because um, I agree with everything he said. I would only say that, uh, of course, I mean, we, we have an ambitious agenda uh, and it's probably going to take longer than two years. I also think, though, that we need time-bound targets. We need to keep the pressure uh, because otherwise 2030 seems like a long time ahead of us when, in fact, uh, I find that after five years, we should already have made a lot of progress. So we need um, metrics, robust metrics that are tied to time-bound solutions um, by 2023, 2024, 25, but we need a timeline and a roadmap to get there. Let me just also add that uh, in addition to what I said about providing more, better quality, faster funding to frontline implementers. We also need to make sure um, that there is some radical transparency and accountability for the work that we do. Um, and starting with uh, the leadership of the grand bargain. So I hope that the new eminent person will be accountable to the broader membership. We'll establish a regular dialogue, not just uh, you know, periodic dialogue at the annual meeting, but really establish a dialogue and an accountability line to the signatory base. Uh, because what happens now is that you see some exclusive discussions taking place um, between uh, certain signatories and the communication doesn't flow. You need 
radical transparency in financial reporting, in the grand bargain governance. Um, and you also need, quite simply, full-time dedicated teams. Um, I think uh, Sigrid Kag has provided incredible leadership before her, Kristalina Georgieva. The problem is that aid reform is not a, a night job. It's not something that you add to your full plate, to your no. daily job. It requires focus, leadership, negotiations, that in itself is a huge workload. And I hope that the next eminent person really focuses uh, all the time on this. Um, if you have the leadership, you combine it with a robust uh, governance structure, robust negotiations, you'll see the results. If you expect aid reform to happen on the side by magic, we're gonna be waited until 2030, 2040, and so on. So a plea to provide funding to the implementers, empower or just let local actors empower themselves. They don't need us to, to be empowered. Yeah. Radical transparency, but also you need to really focus on aid reform, make it your top priority and results will come. Mm -hmm. Many thanks, Farida. Um, I hear we have two more pressing questions from the chat, but I want to give the floor to Smruti as well on my uh, previous question. And then we can take a final round and um, then wrap up, please. Smruti, um, shall we extend the grant bargain for another 10 years or nine? Or is that rather than an excuse to keep things uh, progressing slowly, if at all? So, um, as Alliance for Empowering Partnerships, that was the first thing we demanded, um, actually, that it needs to be a longer term process, but with transparent goals, right, that are over the years, as Klaus says, every two years, or you know, you need those goals, because um, without that and a matrix of accountability for those goals, I think we will not move forward. So we do need a longer term process as the first thing. I think that the second thing is that we, um, you know, we keep talking about accountability and um, one of the things we've seen and I've seen over the last five years is there's been a lot of funding raised for localization. But when you look at the impact of that, how much is actually going to local organizations well, I would love to count the cost of that. I would love to count the cost of all the research that's happened and no action that's taken. What is the impact of that, right? You keep talking exactly. about you know, efficiencies and effectiveness. Let's look, make you accountable for the money that you are raising in the name of localization. I think that's really, really key going forward because I see lots of this happening. I would love to have a study on this, by the way. Um, but most of all, uh, really, the change starts with us, each and every one of us, right? And wherever we are sitting, unless we change our attitudes and behavior and really open our minds to new way of working and really connect with the heart in, on this discussion, you know, and have the will to change, I don't think nothing is going to move. But, you know, the, but we have to be hopeful and we have to think longer term. 2030 is a great goal. But with real, uh, I think, real kind of uh, two-year goals which are accountable, um, and I think that thing um, you mentioned, Farida, about you know um, the definitions of local actors, we must revisit this because this is graying the area um, and is creating a lot of confusion. Right. And country level. Uh, implementation is absolutely must. So institutionalizing these commitments at country level is how you will get impact, practical impact. Mm -hmm. Many thanks, Ruti. We definitely want to give uh, our audience a second chance to raise comments and questions and not only to talk about participation. So um, I hand over again to Andrea. Yes, um, I do have one round of questions and one comment and I'm going to um, 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 articulate both of them right now. The first uh, question is from Markus Geiser from the ICRC and he actually touched upon something that uh, you have kind of... Um, 
dedicated a little bit of your time already. He asks uh, about the role of governments. So what about governments of host states where humanitarian action happens? It strikes me that the governments that are after all granting access or not don't seem to be part of this discussion. Why? Because we are afraid of further breaks on access by authoritarian states, um, because there is sometimes a reluctance by humanitarians to also integrate local and national actors and state services like hospitals, water board authorities, etc., PP, in definition what localized humanitarian action is. So this is um, a very concrete question towards um, the role of um, um, local authorities and local governments. And then there is um, a comment by Leda Garcia Daera from Brazil. He writes, um, as a local actor from Brazil, managing five indigenous refugee population shelters at the humanitarian response to the Venezuelan crisis, we feel that as implementing partners of the UNHCR, we often find ourselves caught, caught up in bureaucracy that does not prioritize the beneficiaries, but is concerned with details of visibility without taking the stage of development and autonomy as a priority. Um, in our point of view, dialogue, listening to the population assisted, parallel to the search for a dialogue with those who make the decisions actually is fundamental for lasting solutions out, outside the shelter's um, setup. And he continues to say, thank you. It's an outstanding pa uh, panel uh, music to our ears. So this um, thank you goes to um, our excellent speakers. and. Um, Please, the last round of um, questions is yours. Who would like to start? Um, we give it all to you, the two questions remaining now. So you all have a chance to think about it uh, really for a minute or something like now. Two tough questions. Um, but um, Farida, would you be ready to jump on that? Okay, can you repeat the questions <laughs> just uh, very succinctly? Um, I, I don't, well, I mean, the question on access, I mean, I, I have been involved in many work streams of the Grand Bargain, uh, but at least to my knowledge, we haven't really tackled the issue of access. Um, my engagement, IRC's engagement uh, is very much focused on ways to improve the effectiveness and the efficiency of, uh, of humanitarian aid or just aid in general. So you know, we have uh, addressed access, but outside this forum. And usually it is true, though, that uh, a lot of times access is impacted by bureaucratic impediments. Um, and technocratic uh, legal issues that, again, would be better addressed um, at the top, and then the decision would need to cascade through the departments and of the agencies or the local authorities. It's always uh, an uphill battle when you try to solve uh, a broader issue purely at the technical level, and that's something that I think um, needs to be addressed once and for all uh, with, the, um, with the new grand bargain. Um, can you repeat the second question? I'm sorry. The second aspect was more um, a comment on the logics of uh, visibility rather than um, um, listening to the needs of the affected population. So um, you can either... Right. Um, yes. Yeah. So... Yeah, on this one, we actually have engaged a lot uh, within and beyond the grand bargain. Um, and it has to deal with what I said earlier about centering our clients, our people in aid. So really bringing them into the design of our programs and our policies. So not just promoting participation, but making sure they are part of our core programming strategy from the start. It all starts with what they say they need, what they think is best. Uh, we act as supporters of, of what, they, what they think is, uh, is, is top priority for them. So we try to, uh, to, to promote that at the core of our activities. And in fact, uh, thanks also to the Grand Bargain, we have uh, developed a uh, what we call client responsiveness uh, approach, uh, which has been quite an uh, uh, impactful sector uh, when it comes to participation. But apart from that, um, I think there is definitely um, um, a link between participation 
and localization. And we hope that the next grand bargain can finally sort of merge the two or address the two into the, a broader discourse that some people call decolonization. Um, you know, we can label it differently. I think rather than, than moving into the debate on definitions, the most important thing is to tackle the issues the substance of the debate and try to to get some, some consensus. Mm -hmm. Klaus, would you like to comment on the visibility one? Um, is that an outdated concept? I mean, if we take uh, the needs of people seriously and what they ask for and to put that into the driver's seat, um, is visibility maybe really a second issue and maybe even distracting even resources as I know from my past? I, I hate I hate this notion, but uh, we have to we have to live with it because if a minister has to go to his or her own parliament and ask for money, there has to be information, there has to be communication, there has to be some kind of visibility. There are different ways. What I really don't like is being the flag, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but there has to be some kind of of feedback from the field to the people that bring in the funding so that they can see something that is uh, of value. And, and it's a whole discussion by itself. It's, uh, it's very complicated. So it, it, it could be a burden. It shouldn't be a burden for the guys out there in the front line. But, uh, but we need some kind of visibility. It will not go away. It will not go away. Perhaps one word, if you allow me, Ralph, on the role of governments. Uh, I, I, um, I, I do believe that uh, governments um, in the affected countries should have a voice. And it's actually probably something we forgot in the design of the grand bargain. Uh, we were very keen to have the donors and then the INGOs and then uh, the agencies and this uh, Bermuda Triangle that could sort themselves out. And then we forget about the governments. But. But um, I think they play a, a key role uh, when we talk about needs assessments and when we talk about the famous participation resolution, uh, revolution. And, and they pay, play a key role in the next step from the uh, needs assessment, which is the humanitarian response plan. You cannot, you cannot imagine a humanitarian response plan unless you at least have tried to engage the Uh, government. Then you have predatory governments that kill their people. This is a different story. But this should be in our reflex. And I think actually the next eminent person should find a way to engage with governments and to find out how we can bring them into the process. Mm -hmm. It Klaus, now you are broken. Right here we can't hear you at all, actually. Um, so maybe we move on quickly to Smruti and give you a chance later on again. Smruti, would you like to comment on uh, these two questions? Um, so please um, jump in. So I will take up where... That's Klaus my view. <laughs> I will um, jump in where Klaus left off. Klaus, we, we didn't hear the last bit of your comment. Uh, but this, this thing about government... It's their responsibility, just like the government in the Western countries, right? To look after their people. So they have to be in the picture. Um, I understand, you know, when people say, oh, but in the countries mm -hmm. where there's crisis or where, where it's, you know, the government is perpetrating against the population, it's a different thing. But that is not everywhere. Mm -hmm. Yet what, what I have seen in the, the years that I have been in emergency response is that governments are not at the table when there is coordination going on around uh, of the response even. So I've seen that in Nepal, I've seen the first time in, in Bangladesh and in, in other places. So they have to be a key part of this. It's their country, it's, you know, it's their people, it's their yeah. responsibility going yeah. forward. Uh, the second part is, and they should be at the table at the ground bargain, by the way, as well. And, you know, the, the, there is a need for that. Um, the second one I want to talk about is this thing about uh, access. You know, one of the reasons in the crisis situations, on one hand, a lot of people talk about impartiality and, you know, all the kind of humanitarian principles, but they partner with local organizations is because of access, right? 
they have the access and international organizations cannot move even in some of those places. So access is a, an issue. And, you know, let's make most of, of that in terms of uh, how local organizations can work in these places and, um, and not start labeling them uh, as, oh, they can't abide by the humanitarian principles because you partner for them for a reason. The third one is logos and visibility. My goodness me, <laughs> when I was doing that tsunami evaluation, you know how <laughs> it, it is a logo land, right? Mm. It's so many logos. I have never seen such a thing in my life. It was horrendous. So, uh, you know, we are polluting these places <laughs> with, with the, all these logos. So I think visibility in its, um, yeah, it needs to be thought about a bit, a bit more succinctly, uh, you know, because we don't think about visibility of the people who are actually doing the work, right? Those local actors, why are they not visible in your reports? We should be talking about that. Why are the people not visible who are actually doing work at the community level? That's the visibility we need. And that visibility to your taxpayers and, you know, because that doesn't exist. Why is there not visibility of the people who are doing the work to your populations, to your parliament? That is really, really important. I understand that, you know, um, your governments want obviously to be known that it's their support that's coming in. That's part of the solidarity. No problem with that. But when it's a size of, a, you know, I mean, what I've seen in the different places in the world where I've been, it's horrendous. So let's kind of rethink a little bit. And remember, the amount of money that's going into that visibility material, let's give it to the local organization so they can reach more people. My God, simple, right? If you if you think about it, this is a no-brainer. Let's let's think rethink about the visibility and how much money we invest in there and how much of that money can go to more people and saving more lives. Um, so I think I will stop there, but we, we really need to make sure going forward that we have a, a lot more inclusive process. Um, say that Friday you were talking about the governance. Um, I think, uh, Klaus, you talked about that as well. At principles level, who are the principles? Name me one local actor that's sitting at the principles table. None, right? We can't have a process like this without local actors being there to hold them accountable for those commitments, right? Where is the verification? If you're just talking to yourselves, you're not going to go very far. You're going to go in circles. You need local organizations at that top table mm -hmm. and a good representation. None of these ticking boxes. We're fed up with that, right? It needs to be proper representation. Smoti, maybe really as a final, final question, um, challenging you on... I'm not the only angry one. I'm not the only angry one. It's great. Smoti is coming yeah. also. Well, it's good to hear that you are all upset. Um, that makes a lively panel. <laughs> Um, but um, Smriti, maybe as a final question um, and uh, one challenge to, chair, to share, um, um, if we talk about access, about funding, etc., um, some people perceive it like, like localization sounds a bit like the silver bullet to humanitarian reform, while the uh, uh, opposite view might be, well, it's definitely needed, it's a question of accountability, of participation, but what about we might simply localize uh, the flaws of the humanitarian system and put it on the local level with a the competition then on the local level with the competition for funding etc might that be an issue and why are you confident that um, overall the system will really uh, will be a game changer if we make progress on the localization front well I think look um, if you and and the whole discussion right now is about decolonization right so if you're just localizing that response you're not decolonizing <laughs> you're just putting um, so I, I feel like you're decentralizing your response. So in, in a way, uh, your um, international organizations who work at local level, you know, will do the response. But is that really your responsibility? What about the people, the citizens, right? It is citizens' responsibility also to take that uh, responsibility to, uh, you know, safeguard populations. So it's really about that motivation. I think, look, 
in um, in other countries, we we in in all countries, we are saying that civil society organizations are one of the key part of democracy, right? They are there to hold account the the government to account, the private sector to account. So why is that a rule different for local organizations in some countries, mm. right? We need to give that space, right? Um, there's always this issue about, oh, they're not accountable, but actually um, I've done, for six years I was working for HAP and the number of organizations I've visited, probably they have more accountability in place it's just that they don't have all the bureaucracy and policies and procedures written stuff right mm. but actually they're really very much accountable i think somebody also in the comment was saying um is there something about you know localization versus accountability to affect the population no mm -hmm. we need institutions right mm -hmm. you know in a big emergency not people uh, can't do things for themselves they need institutions to help them mm -hmm. we know that from our own experience in the western mm -hmm. world so i think we need to give the same um yeah same uh i would say uh you know um support to the institutions at local level mm -hmm. and governments are also should be part of that process right they should be building these these mm. institutions that right. can help their populations in crisis and this is a longer term process you know development cannot happen from outside mm. and humanitarian aid how long can international safety net continue we know that the funding is shrunk, shrinking right so we need to also make sure that there are sustainable things uh, at local level. Mm -hmm. Also for climate change stuff, right? You cannot fly in from different places, response, because that also costs uh, environmentally as well. So let's think about that as well. Many Thank thanks, Muti. Um, I think uh, that has been a really good roundup from your side, and um, uh, I'm forcing again that uh, the local level is a really key. Um, Klaus, maybe um, if we come to a conclusion from each panelist on the future division of labor between the various actors, um, if you would now move a bit from the donor perspective and have a final comment, what would you expect from the international NGOs, from the UN? What could be a future role, um, and maybe uh, your input also for the following panel, as we, then we will discuss the role of intermediaries uh, in this uh, future humanitarian system we all hope for. Well, first of all, um, now COVID, uh, unfortunately, has put back uh, the fulfillment of the sustainable development goals by between 10 to 15 years in uh, a lot of the most fragile countries. So my hope, which I normally express, that countries will inevitably sort of become stronger and be able to take care more of themselves. And this is something we have to welcome and we have to nurture that. That hope is uh, dashed a little bit these days. But nevertheless, the whole purpose of whatever we do has to make countries more self-reliant. And, and this notion of resilience, I think, should stay in our mind. And it is actually linked to the localization agenda because every time we say the life of somebody, we have to think, how would they be able to save that life themselves in next year and the year after? Talking about climate change and pandemics and whatever. So that should be a reflex. And that brings me to the uh, role of intermediaries. Um, I mean, uh, <laughs> if I had a magic stick and a magic wand and could just say to uh, ministers of finance, uh, give the money straight to uh, um, an NGO in, uh, in, uh, in Kenya, um, I would do it. Um, I may lose a little bit of money, but it will probably be very efficient. The problem is it doesn't work. It, it needs, so we need to put, we need to use some of these intermediaries, but we have to say to them, engage, engage, put, put the locals on the payroll. Stop taking your cut the 7% or whatever they take to cover their overheads. We are going to check that. And it goes for the UN guys, but it also goes for the, the international NGOs. Uh, partner up, uh, make sure that, that uh, you, you, you give them a full seat at the table. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think that's, that's the way to, to do it. And then if some are courageous enough to go directly, they, they should do that. Mm -hmm. I saw in the chat that somebody said that the country-based pool funds nevertheless are not really going to the locals. I, I think they have a 
possibility to do it and they should be pushed to do it more. So uh, point taken. Many thanks, Klaus. Um, Farida, a final word. Um, it sounds like uh, there is a request for more pressure on international NGOs to move and to turn maybe tables and become more in a role of enablers. Is that a uh, fair objective and a fair uh, summary or what would be your key takeaway? Well, that's definitely something that uh, we should consider. I also see the smoothie in the chat is using the word complementarity, which features high in our position paper uh, that's coming out today, because um, we think that intermediaries have a role to play when they are guided by local actors. So they should tell us what they need to make sure that the systems that are already in place work. Um, and this goes back to what I was saying at the beginning of the session. We have experience and expertise as international actors. Local actors have primary expertise and experience as the primary responders uh, in a country situation. An effective partnership is when we bring these two worlds together and they complement each other. So let's work around that. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't throw the baby with the bathwater. Mm -hmm. There are some synergies and comparative advantages that can really make humanitarian aid more effective in terms of speed, in terms of coordination. The consortium approach, for example, has been piloted in many cases with promising results. Country-based pool funding, again, is another um, mechanism that seems to work very well, even at a uh, national level. It can be improved. Donors need to be convinced, as I said earlier, that um, it's not just a question of transferring risk down the transaction chain. It's also a question of sharing the burden. So let's have a, a 360-degree conversation about what it means to contextualize, to localize effectively. And again, you know, let me just conclude by refocusing uh, the attention on what happens on the front lines, because that's where um, our policies and practice matter the most. Many thanks, Farida. Um, I think that has been really a lively uh, discussion and you really uh, touched on so many points um, uh, reflecting the grand bargain, the discussions and the ones upcoming the next two days. We touched on the many flaws of the humanitarian system. Why surely tomorrow morning we will hear about uh, the success stories and how in which areas it's functioning, for example, from a German government perspective. Um, but for now, uh, we have to conclude. Uh, we will take a final look when we have concluded on um, uh, what Nicolines Take the takeaways have been and we can all use the break to uh, have a look at the graphic design and uh, we will keep it uh, for sure uh, ourselves but for now it's time to say a big thank you uh, thank you to Smruti to Klaus um, to Farida for um, joining us for sharing your views um, for sharing your very different angles uh, looking into the grand bargain and your experiences in the process so for now a big thank you we take a break we are back in 30 minutes uh, to discuss again the role of local actors and of international NGOs and intermediaries uh, and deep dive into this really crucial issue. So a big thank you from us and a big thank you for Andrea, who I made um, uh, share with us uh, the chat uh, for a long time now, but I think it was worthwhile and really good questions from the audience as, uh, as well. Many thanks and bye-bye. Uh,